Okay, physics students, welcome to the uh, final video dealing with um, electric circuits. <clears throat> and in this video, I'm going to encapsulate all of topic 5.3. We're going to talk about electric cells or batteries. And I'm going to start off by having a discussion about electromotive force or EMF. I've alluded to EMF being a potential difference across a cell or a battery before, but in this video I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to sort of formally define exactly what I mean by the concept of EMF. Now remember, we made the analogy uh, which we're slowly breaking away from between uh, electric current and water flow through a pipe. And we said that in some ways electric current is like water flow. So in the case of water, water always goes from a region of higher gravitational potential energy to lower, okay? And in the case of, um, of say a vertical pipe uh, if we wanted to make the water go up the pipe to the very top and make it flow in the direction indicated in the diagram, we'd have to have a pump that actually does work against gravity uh, in order to get it up top, and then it would naturally fall down through the paddle wheel on the right-hand side. So the pump would force a water flow, and it would force the water to flow in a direction in which it would not naturally go. Water obviously goes from, from higher to lower. It would naturally fall, okay? But this is a conversion of work into kinetic energy. All right. You can think of a battery in an electric circuit very much the same way as a water pump. All right. So it forces a current and there's a conversion of chemical energy inside of that battery into electrical energy. And this is stuff, this is stuff that you guys all know at this point. I mean, I think I probably showed you the slide several times. All right. Um, but we're going to see another way in which this analogy uh, gets looser and looser to the point that you really shouldn't get hung up on it. All right. So like water being pushed by a pump, electrons or electric charge must, must be pushed through a circuit. Therefore, work is done on them. And in fact, the definition of electromotive force, or EMF, is, is the definition is one that has work in it. And it's the amount of chemical energy converted to electrical energy per unit charge. This means that it's also, because of the work energy theorem, it's the total work done in moving a unit charge all the way around a circuit. So in other words, it's, um, it's W over Q, and the units are, of course, volts and joules per coulomb. Uh, so this EMF, which is symbolized by the, by, this, the, by the Greek letter epsilon, it's also the maximum potential difference between the, ba the battery terminals, or the voltage rating of the battery. Okay? Now, it's also, you can also think of it as the total power generated by the battery per unit current because of, uh, because of P equals IV. It's the voltage rating of the battery. It's also referred to as the terminal voltage or the terminal potential difference. Okay, so it's just a lot of different ways to say the same thing. And it's a real misnomer because it's not a force. Um, it has to do with force, but the electromotive force is actually a potential difference and it's measured in volts. It's a voltage, all right? Okay, now it turns out that, remember when we talked about circuits, we said that every single component in a circuit, including the wire, actually has a resistance to it. You can never have zero resistance, and that's because you can never escape the effects of friction when you have something moving through something else or across something else. If we consider a standard 9-volt battery, say like a D-sized battery or whatever, okay, in a practical uh, fashion, I told you to consider... Um, the negative terminal as being 0 volts and the positive terminal as being 9 volts such that delta V was, was 9 volts between them. And of course it's the change in potential difference or the potential difference between the ends that makes charge flow and that's really all that we care about is the difference. Okay, So if the EMF is the voltage rating of the battery and that's 9 volts, but then we put, um, put a voltmeter across the terminals of the battery and I've done this for you, the actual potential difference is is uh, is would be less than nine volts, or it certainly wouldn't be nine volts. In some cases, it's more, but that's just because it's um, uh, irregularities in terms of how the battery was made. But generally speaking, the potential difference would actually be less. Why would that be? Well, it's because inside of the batteries, there are chemicals that create a small resistance that can't be isolated, and it's unavoidable. It's always there, and this little internal resistance, well, this little resistance is called internal resistance. And in physics, we denote internal resistance by little r, lowercase r. So whenever you see lowercase r in an application of Ohm's law, it's going to be an internal resistance situation. Every uppercase r would be just a regular uh, resistance, like a resistance of a resistor or any other component. So again, you can think of it as a little resistor connected in series with the circuit. So here you see that here's an ideal battery, but a real battery. So up until now, we've been neglecting uh, internal resistance, and we've been treating the potential difference between the terminals as, as being the voltage rating or the EMF. Um, but um, 
Now we're going to deal with the internal resistance, okay? Um, so the chemicals inside a battery, uh, traditional batteries are mercury or cadmium, and these are toxic, okay? So the chemical reaction is toxic. There's, of course, a movement nowadays to make cleaner, more environmentally friendly batteries, but that, um, that technology has a ways to go. So there's a little voltage drop of IR inside every battery. So therefore, the actual potential difference across the battery is really the EMF of the battery minus this little, uh, this little potential or this little voltage drop. Or in other words, you can rearrange it and find that the EMF is I times the quantity R plus R, okay? Where R is the total resistance of the circuit, okay? Um, so there's some misconceptions about circuits. I want you to not fall into these traps of thinking that current can be used up in a circuit. It's not. Uh, current flow is not energy transfer necessarily, and the electron flow rate is not the current, okay? So a couple of things to really think about. Now, since V equals epsilon minus IR, obviously the effect of R is to reduce the potential difference across the battery. So in a practical sense, we have the negative side would be zero, and the positive side would actually be epsilon minus IR, okay? Or the voltage rating of the battery minus the reality uh, of what's actually going on inside. It's not going to be epsilon, it's not going to be the potential difference, or it's not going to be the EMF anymore, okay? Um, and always, you can see, because of the fact that R can never be zero, V is always less than epsilon. Now, like I said, unless stated otherwise, we assume that the internal resistance is zero. And you can think of charge moving around a circuit kind of like you going around a shopping mall. When you go up the escalator, it's like a battery giving you potential energy pushing you up the hill. When you come down the stairs, well, that would happen naturally, or you would fall that vertical distance naturally because you go from high potential to low potential energy. So internal resistance is like a little step on top which lessens the height of the hill slightly. So you go up the escalator, instead of actually being that high, you're actually only that high minus that, that, that bit. So that's another analogy to the, to the gravitational and electrical um, potential energy situation. So the first example, why don't you try this one? So I have a battery of EMF 12 volts, internal resistance 1.5 ohms, the potential difference across the battery terminals. That's easy. V equals epsilon minus IR, okay? Here's another example. You might want to pause the video and try this one. They're going to get successively more complicated. So in this case, I have an EMF of 9 volts at a battery with an internal resistance of 1 ohm connected in series to a 2 ohm resistor is shown. How much current flows through the circuit? Well, we want to get a real value for the current. So we're going to apply Ohm's law, but the total resistance is going to be R2, which is going to be the resistor, the 2 ohm resistor plus the 1 ohm resistor, and I get 3 amps. And that's, re that's what I would really measure in the laboratory. The rest, what we did before was more theory. This is more reality. And the voltage drop across the 2 ohm resistor, you guys know how to do circuits now. Um, I get 6 volts, so clearly the internal voltage drop within the battery is 3 volts because, um, because 3 plus 6 equals 9, uh, and the EMF was 9 volts. That was the voltage rating of the battery. Okay. All right, here's a little more complicated one. You might want to pause and work this one out before you see my solution. So there's a car battery. The EMF, or the rating, is 12 volts, and the internal resistance is 0 0.0, that should read 0 0.010 ohms. This resistance is relatively large because the battery is old and the terminals are corroded. Determine the terminal voltage when the current drawn from the battery is 10 amps and 100 amps. Well, the voltage needed to make a current of 10 amps to go through that resistance is going to be 0.1 volts. So therefore, applying V equals epsilon minus IR, I just subtract that from the EMF of the battery and I get 11.9 um, volts. Now, in the case of 100 amps, um, you see that the, um, the terminal voltage is actually much smaller here. Uh, it's going to be 11 volts. So we see that the more, the, more, um, the more current that goes through, that it's drawn from a battery, um, the greater the terminal voltage drop is going to be. Okay. Now, you need to be able to use, uh, in the IV, you need to be able to use graphing techniques to determine the EMF and res internal resistance of a battery. So if you consider this particular circuit right here, Okay, you see I have a voltmeter connected uh, in parallel with the battery and a variable resistor. Okay, and that voltmeter is placed such that it measures the potential difference across the battery. If we alter R and we tabulate values of V and I and make a graph, um, we would get something like this. We'd get a straight line with a negative slope. Okay, now since V equals epsilon or the EMF minus IR, 
<clears throat> you can see this is of the form y equals mx plus b with a little bit of algebraic re rearrangement. And I'll do an example for you in just a second. Um, and the gradient would be negative r because, of course, i is the, is, the, is the horizontal or independent variable. Okay, So you need to be able to handle problems like this. Okay, and here's an example of one such problem. There's a figure that shows how the potential difference across the terminals of a cell varies with the current. And I want you to figure out from this graph the EMF of the battery and its internal resistance. Well, if you note that, that V, again, V equals the EMF minus uh, IR, I'm going to rearrange this such that it's of the form Y equals MX plus B. Then you can clearly see that the Y intercept is going to give you the EMF and that the gradient is going to give you, the negative gradient is going to give you um, little r, which is the internal resistance. And it's that easy, pretty straightforward, okay? I want to talk a little bit um, more about conventional current. I've alluded to this a little bit, and it's a little bit confusing for you guys, uh, I'm sure, still. But remember that it's actually the negative charge that flows through the wires, but it's customary to show the current direction as if it were the positive charge is moving. And you've seen this current, or you've seen this circuit before, all right? Again, you can, uh, you can think about the battery as being a hill. Down, down that hill, charge falls, okay? Um, and we talked about all of this when I, when I first introduced you the, the concept of um, circuits and a component in series. In this case, we have a resistor in series with a battery, okay? All right. Now, you've also seen this particular uh, circuit before. We saw this circuit before, and um, I alluded to the fact that there's something called internal resistance which, um, which I said I was going to explain to you guys later. So let's work, rework this problem considering internal resistance because now you understand it. So I've reduced this circuit down to an equivalent circle with a total resistance of 12 ohms, all right? Noting conventional current this way, all right? Okay, by the way, these are the values that you need to know, obviously. Okay, um, now for the whole circuit, the current going through the whole circuit is 2 amps, all right? Uh, the voltage at the positive terminal is 24, at the negative is 0, all right? Um, and I do all, this, all, all these relationships using Ohm's Law, which is now old hat for you guys. Now, if I consider that the battery has an internal resistance of 1 ohm, then the total resistance is going to be 13 ohms. I just add that to my 12 ohms that I did before. So now the current leaving the battery is going to be a little bit less, right? By Ohm's Law, I equals V over R. And, and V equals the EMF of the battery minus IR. And you're going to get 22.15 volts when you do this calculation, all right? So that means that the actual, the EMF, again, the EMF of the battery, the rating, the voltage rating is going to be 12, um, 24 volts in this case. But if you were to actually put, uh, put a voltmeter over those terminals, you'd get 22.15. And note that V is always less than epsilon, as always it has to be. So that's an example of, um, of using little r in a circuit. All right, I want to talk about primary and secondary cells. So you know that batteries lose their ability to maintain a potential difference over time. Why? Well, it's because the chemicals inside wear out, and uh, there's, a, there's a very gentle increase of internal resistance because it basically gets old and starts to corrode. There are two terms in physics, in IV physics, that you need to know with respect to cells. One is the uh, primary cell, which is a cell that can be used once, then discarded, and a secondary cell, which is a rechargeable cell, which can be used repeatedly. We're going to talk a little bit about how cells charge and discharge, and this is a great pre-conversation to our discussion on capacitors, which we're going to study later. It turns out that cells can be used to charge one another. So if you look at this particular circuit, you have a 12-volt battery and a 2-volt battery. Um, it turns out that we can use the 12-volt battery, which is the stronger battery, to actually charge the 2-volt battery uh, if, it's a if, it's, if, it's, if it's got the chemical makeup to be recharged, if it's a rechargeable battery. Now, by Kirchhoff, this should be very familiar to you by now, we have that the sum of the voltages is 0. By this algebra, you can check my algebra, this yields that the current through the circuit is 0.625 amps. Now, that, so the total power generated by this battery here, the stronger one, is going to be 7.5 watts. However, the total resistance for this entire circuit is 16 ohms. So it's um, 6 plus 6 plus 2 plus 2. Um, uh, 
That's right, so 16 ohms. So the total power dissipated by all the resistors is actually 6.25 watts, all right? Because I'm using P equals V squared times R. But so there's a difference here, right? And the difference is 1.25 watts. So that power is the amount of energy per unit time that's stored in the two volt cell, which is being charged. So this is a quantitative treatment of how one cell can charge another, a rechargeable cell. All right, so it turns out that a cell can be characterized by how much how much charge it can deliver in its in a particular lifetime or in, in the lifetime of the cell and we call this the capacity of a cell which is a little bit confusing because this is different from another electrical component called the capacitor which can also store energy which we'll talk about later so you can see from this bad or from this uh, diagram here that here are three sample graphs of how the terminal voltage um, changes over time for certain batteries. And you can see that, and this are, these are for typical batteries, typical cells, you can see that initially every type of battery loses its initial value of its terminal voltage fairly quickly. And then for most of its lifetime, it has a fairly stable terminal voltage, all right? And then sort of at, towards the end of its lifetime, uh, it has a very rapid decrease to zero as the cell discharges completely. This is just how batteries behave. So also note that the greater the current, the faster the cell discharges, okay, which is maybe not surprising. The more current that you're drawing from it, the faster it will sort of wear out, I guess. Uh, and the other thing I want you to notice is that, or to know, is that this gentle drop in, in, the, in the terminal voltage for most of its lifetime is due partly to an increasing internal resistance. And that increasing internal resistance comes as the cell gets older. It starts to corrode. It maybe starts to get some internal rust or whatever inside. The chemicals wear out. And all of that means that the internal resistance actually starts uh, increasing slightly as the, um, as the lifetime of the battery proceeds.